I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is Senate Finance, January 13th. And I think we're still missing one committee member, but I'm going to start. Um, the, item, uh, the agenda today is to get an update from the Department of Education on um, the CRF money that they received. How, there were several bundles, what that status is, what they did with it. I believe there was 14 million returned, which I believe Joint Fiscal has not used, but um, I know I've, I'm hearing positive things, which we'll know next week when we get the revenue update about the revenue status um, in the Ed Fund. But just kind of walking us through we the whole November 1st letter that set people kind of into a tizzy and then um, where we are now. But I think we'll start and I know Secretary French needs to leave by two, so we'll start with him. So Secretary, welcome, and the floor is yours. You have a lot of people with you, so I'll let you just kind of orchestrate. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It's good to see you. It seems just like a couple of months ago we were meeting, so it's... <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> well, nice to see you all again. Um, yeah, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's been a lot of hard work. Uh, it's also been a fairly dynamic situation. Um, you know, you alluded to the um, sort of the, the 15 million, 14 million, right when we were in the process of doing that, the new package was announced, which included an extension of the CRF for a whole nother year. So, um, <clears throat> but today I, I do, uh, we have 30 minutes, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, but I do, uh, that was important to bring our team in that's been dealing very directly on these programs uh, in all kinds of details. So Bill Bates, our CFO, Brad James, I think who you've met Brad before, and Jill Briggs, who's been a wonderful addition to our team, who's been uh, really wonderful managing a lot of the detail on this. So it's been a it's been a very challenging piece of work. Every time these programs come out, we have to stand up, you know, new ways to allocate the funds and manage it and so forth. And uh, I was, I was uh, pleasantly uh, sort of surprised. I just assumed all states were moving forward so energetically, and I guess apparently they're not. Um, you know, Vermont has been very successful, I think, and part of it's our partnership with our legislators on, on being able to get these funds out the door as rapidly as possible. So, you know, thank you for your support. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to our CFO, uh, Bill Bates, who um, can, I think Bill's gonna share his screen perhaps and um, invite the others to uh, take you through a presentation and answer your questions. Thanks, Dan. Let me see if I can um, share my screen here. Dave need to make you a co-host. I think Faith did. Let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, yes. Care summary. It is up. Excellent. All right. Well, Madam Chair, uh, thank you for having us. And uh, if it would be all right, I'd like to uh, just take a brief moment and introduce our newest uh, team member. That is uh, Jill Briggs Campbell. Um, she uh, came onto the scene about 10 months ago. And I think, Jill, it was your first week on the job that uh, we uh, said, surprise, surprise, surprise. We're gonna uh, repurpose your uh, position for uh, a temporary basis to help out and the agency COVID response. Um, she, Jill, has uh, been with the team for about 10 months. We hired her as a business project manager and as the results-based accountability uh, lead. But uh, like I said, uh, COVID hit about 10 months ago, just as she was coming on board. And she has uh, done a remarkable job of uh, helping us navigate the uh, everything COVID. Jill, do you want to- I was to, uh, told this morning that it is 10 months ago today that the legislature got sent home. So I hope, Jill, you don't take that personally if you got <laughs> hired and we went home on the same- it, it was my first day, actually, was the day that everybody went home. <laughs> oh, welcome to our strange new world. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I've been told I need to say, Jill Briggs Campbell, Agency of Education, when I sign on here. 
Um, yeah, uh, as Bill said, it's it's been a wild ride. Um, I've been on uh, managing the the federal emergency funds as well as um, working with Ted Fisher on the COVID nineteen response team. So that's included all of the school testing and and all of those um, missions as well. So. Uh, Needless to say, it's been a crash course. Um, <laughs> uh, in particular with the federal emergency funds and this next um, bucket of funding, which I'm sure we'll touch on today. Uh, if you you know, need details on the status of any particular fund at any time, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I'll probably have my fingers in all of those pots as well. So um, I'm available for whatever information you need. And I'll, I'll hand it back to Bill with that. But thank you all for having me here today. All right, thank you, Jill. So uh, yes, Bill Bates, uh, for the record, uh, Agency of uh, Education. And what we would like to do is give you a high level overview of care summary, uh, which would include ESSER gear. And uh, we've got in here, uh, CRF summer food and child nutrition. We also have, uh, Joining us today, Brad James, he's going to also provide a, uh, a deeper dive into the uh, CRF uh, portion of it uh, as far as uh, CRF is concerned for LEA and uh, independent schools. And so with that, we'll uh, proceed to the next slide. So as you're familiar, we have uh, received $28 million as of uh, March 27th, and this is ESSER money that we're talking about here as part of the CARES Act. And that uh, grant goes from March 13th of 2020 all the way out to uh, September 30th. And that uh, if you jump down on uh, as of January 12th of 21, we have uh, 11 LEAs uh, that have approved grant awards totaling $6.7 million. And you might wonder, all right, well, we we were awarded 28 million. We've only uh, awarded $6.7 million. Why is that? You'll recall that uh, with CRF, it had a very short window of uh, use. And uh, originally it was going to expire on December 30th of 2020. And then we just got an extension for 12 months. But uh, the LEAs, and I think rightfully so, uh, have been focused most of their attention on utilize, utilizing the CRF funds initially. And now that uh, we've done that, you're likely going to see uh, a more rapid application process with the uh, ESSER funds for LEA. Um, they have until March 20th of 21 to submit their applications. And Jill, I think uh, just earlier this morning, you had an LEA calling you and walking you through asked you to walk them through the application process for uh, for ESSER, is that right? Yes, that, that is correct. And we're definitely starting to see sort of all the team members are starting to get more inquiries about ESSER. So they're they're turning their attention to it. Um, what, what kind of things are the grants for? That's a great question, and uh, thank you for the segue. Let's jump right over to the uh, the next slide. I think it'll uh, highlight for uh, everyone where we see the funds being used based on the uh, the approved applications that we've received to date. And you can see from this chart here that uh, the bulk of the uh, money is going to uh, salary and benefits for teachers on. Uh, remote instruction, then you've got a, a significant amount uh, being applied to supplies and equipment, uh, meeting healthcare guidelines, additional staffing, and then uh, also the cost for school operations. And Jill, we, uh, we aligned these to the US Ed object codes, is that right? Yeah, it, it was a little bit tricky to put these in these kinds of buckets. Um, our schools track them by accounting object code. So I will say these are a little bit arbitrary in terms of how I broke them out, but these are sort of the, the major cost categories that we're seeing. And the additional staff is going to include, just to break that out a little bit more, because I think we'll see actually a lot of costs going into there. Um, the hiring of 
full-time substitutes in case of losing staff because they had to quarantine or positive cases, whatever it may be. Um, the hiring of additional COVID nurses or coordinators and the hiring of additional um, paraprofessionals. Um, so that is uh, one of the, the buckets of funding in addition to uh, salaries and benefits for teachers for remote instruction. Those are kind of the major, if we added those two together, I, I would say, as, as Bill mentioned, that, that would be the bulk of spending. Yeah. So going forward, I can carry these categories over. As I said, it's a, it's a little clunky, but we can work within those. And now the uh, next slide, sorry, go ahead. Madam Chair, do you wanna wait for questions till the end? Um, no, we can take questions. I just can't see you. Okay. So I'm going to need a yellow hand, I think, or just say, Madam Chair. Okay. Madam Chair. Um, uh, so I have a question on salaries benefits for teachers for remote instruction. I'm just not sure. Uh, can you explain that one a little bit? I'm figuring the, these are teachers who already have salaries and benefits when they were in person. What's the... Uh, what's this addressing when they went remote? Jill, do you want to uh, articulate the, uh, the detail that make up the salary benefits for remote instruction? Yes. Um, and, and as I said, this is not a perfect way to do this. I had to sort of do some coding to move those um, costs over. So what was included in here was the hiring of additional staff to teach remote. Um, so it would not be, as you said, um, already budgeted uh, instructors. Uh, it also included things like um, the professional development and planning time that went above and beyond budgeted expenses, uh, you know, training for online teaching, that sort of thing. I included in, in that bucket of spending. Um, and then the uh, supplies and equipment to support continuity of learning or remote education includes things like laptops, uh, supply delivery, um, and those, those sorts of um, costs that are associated with that. I hope that helps to answer the question. Yes, thank you very much. Great. Senator DeBrock, you had a question? Uh, thank you. Uh, I just have a question uh, to make sure that I understood uh, your last couple of slides related to some $28 million that were in March of 2020 uh, uh, made available to the state and that we expended a little over $6 million. Uh, and we didn't know that until December that that money would pass over uh, into 2021. And so my question is, did I understand correctly that we would have left some $22 million on the table based on where we are at the early part of December? Senator Brock, that's a great question. Thank you for uh, raising that. If we uh, go back to the slide just before this, what uh, Senator Brock is uh, highlighting for us in his question is that uh, we have $28 million as of March 27th and then we are taking credit for having awarded 6.7 million as of January 12th, 21. And so the Delta there is the, the 22 million. The key point to uh, highlight is the second bullet point here, Senator Brock and team. It's uh, the grants went from March 13th, 2020 to September 30 of 22. What we were uh, rushing to uh, get granted out and obligated and expended was the CRF funds. And so that's different and separate and apart from the ESSER funds. It was the, uh, the CRF funds had a very short window of use. And that was uh, up until December 30th of last year until uh, the Congress and president uh, passed the bill to extend their use for one more year. Does that help? Well, yes. How much uh, fell into each bucket? How much fell into each bucket? Well, in other words, you, you mentioned that the grant goes for that period of time. The, and, and here we're talking about the $28 uh, million in total uh, as part of the CARES Act. Was all of that $28 million, did it have to be uh, 
applied before that December date or was only a portion of that subject to that stricture? And if only a portion of it was subject to that stricture, what, were the, what was the amount of each portion? Good question. So now this is separate and apart from CRF. So CRF is the uh, the funds that came through the U.S. Treasury, and uh, we have Brad James on the call today. Um, those those and he was leading that effort. Those funds were you. Can, can Bill? Can I jump in for a yep. minute? Yep, please. So Senator Brock, I, th I think what you're asking, I think what you're doing is, I think you are confusing the CRF money okay. and the ESSER money. They're they're both from the CARES Act. You're quite correct about that. Um, they have different uses and they had different time periods. The ESSER money that Jill and Bill have been talking about extended through um, September of 22. So, so that, that 28 million is good up through 22. I think what you're referencing and thinking about is the CRF money that Bill is alluding to. And, yes. and that CRF money was a much larger piece of money and it did expire up, up until the new legislation. It did expire on December, as of December 30th, 2020. Um, but, but that's not the money that we're talking about right here in this slide. Okay, that's, 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 a, that's, a, different, that's a different chunk of money. And that's the money that I'm gonna talk about briefly in a little while. Okay. That money has, been, that, that money has now been extended out for another year. Uh, so I right. think to, I want to say until December 30, 2021 at this point. Okay, so, so that I, money I you're going to cover subsequently. It was, it was yes. a little unclear on which, which funds we were specifically talking yeah. about. No, I, I, I understand your question entirely. Thank <laughs> it's you. unclear when you're in the middle of it, too. So this is the ESSER money only, and it's been right. we've been told since the beginning that we would do the CRF because of the timing first, and then we would get into the ESSER. And it sounds like you are just now starting to take in applications for ESSER funds. That is correct. The, the, the applications have been open, but we have been suggesting to business managers, and the business managers themselves are pretty savvy about this, that, that it's best to use the CRF money first. So they didn't even, a lot of them didn't apply for the ESSER money as they were using the CRF money. Um, and so this is kind of, they are starting to pick this up now. And so as we uh, see on the next slide of the uh, 11 LEAs that have approved grants, this is the breakup of that, uh, that money that Jill spoke about. The next slide is just a, a different view, a different slice of that. It's uh, showing you the, the numerical values of each of those categories. And unless there's a question, I'll move on. The next section is uh, gear, which is another source of funds. This is the governor's emergency uh, recovery uh, funding. And so again, similar to ESSER uh, gear, we had uh, 4.3 million that uh, we received on uh, March 27th of 2020 as part of the CARES Act. And those grants run from July 1st of 2020 through September 30th of 22. And as of uh, January 12th of 21, we had 12 CTE, all 12, or all 17 CTE centers uh, had approved grants. And they have until March 20th to submit any uh, amendments to the AOE. And on the next slide, we have, our, we have a graph that shows how those funds are breaking down, which is similar to what we have, are seeing in uh, ESSER. You can see here that uh, for gear funds, we had supplies and equipment, and then additional staff, and then costs for uh, school operations for uh, in-person. And Jill, any uh, commentary on the uh, the breakout of this and what makes up the uh, the individual uh, bars? Uh, no, I, I kept to the same categories with the exception of obviously food service not being um, one that applied here. Uh, so just as a, a point to reiterate here for the gear funds, which have the same period of performance as the ESSER funds going through September of 2022. Um, these funds, all of the grants have been awarded at this point. 
And, uh, and so all of the um, funds have been budgeted for the most part. So this is um, funding that the CTE centers were definitely eager to jump on and didn't have any of the kind of same obstacles um, in terms of CRF for the debate over equitable services, which also extended the, the ESSER applications as we are waiting for the federal government and some challenges in the court. Um, and so you can see that they've really spent quite or are looking to budget quite a lot on um, modernizing some of their systems so that they can provide hybrid and remote instruction for a lot of the things that would normally be hands-on. Uh, and then also um, the second big bucket over to the right is the cost for school operations in person. They've had to make a lot of adjustments to the actual sort of physical plant and the way that classrooms are set up so that they're not sharing equipment and they can meet the, the safety and health guidelines. Um, so that's why we're seeing the costs are looking a little bit different for gear than they are for ESSER. Funds under supplies and equipment. I heard from a couple teachers who had kids who were doing school at home, a spouse that was working from home and a teacher that was needing to do remote from home and ended up in a parking lot trying to teach her students from her car. Did any of that money go to help with internet hookups, line extensions, anything like that? So in the review of, and are we asking about um, ESSER or GEAR or both? Any of them. Any of them, yeah. Uh, so both the um, making uh, wireless devices available or increasing access to internet are both allowable costs for ESSER and GEAR. Um, I did see, um, and this fell into that bucket of supplies and equipment, you're absolutely right. I did see um, that there was the provision of um, devices to increase Wi-Fi connectivity um, and other sorts of costs like that. I think that um, that sort of, those stories, the sort of anecdotal stories about classes being taught in parking lots, that was very much um, what we were seeing in the early days of school closure. Uh, I would definitely haven't heard, you know, and, and maybe the secretary can speak to this, but at this point I would be surprised to be hearing that, but um, that was definitely an allowable cost and we did see some of that in ESSER. Yeah, I think that that would be my recollection as well. I mean, it's anecdotal. I, we heard a lot more of that in the initial closure period. Um, after the reopening, there's been a lot less of that uh, concern, not to say it's not out there, but I haven't heard as much about it from the superintendents or other stakeholders. Thanks for that, Dan. Go ahead, Bill. Well, Secretary, I, I, I'm sensitive to your time. You, you have a hard stop at two o'clock. Are there other uh, comments that you would like to share before you have to break away? No, I think the just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, I think you know Senator Brock's questioning, you know, just points to you know it's it's we've we've become fluent in these programs, but they are discrete, and separate, and. Uh, it's useful, I think, just to provide everyone with the foundational information, you know, what is ESSER, what is GEAR, what is CRF, and now um, to be somewhat complicated by uh, ESSER 2 and GEAR 2. Uh, so we're, you know, it's a dynamic situation, but um, we, we sometimes take for granted that we have some fluency in this, but I think you'll find it useful just to get a refresher on these. Definitely helpful. Okay. Sure. And, uh... We would be happy to do that, uh, and uh, we could work with Faith uh, to uh, get something set up if that would be useful. And I can, um, I actually have a, a slide that breaks all of that out a little bit more discreetly that I can, I was trying to share it in the chat several times, but it was not working. Um, but that's something that I can send over to the committee if that's helpful. If, if you email any of that background to Faith, yeah. She can make sure we get it. I think a basic definition, I, I know ESSER and I know CRF, gear was new to me. Okay. Um, yeah. So what does gear stand for? The Governor's Emergency Education ah. Response Fund. <laughs> okay, I knew Rolled there was a the governor. Okay, I knew there was a governor's fund. I just hadn't 
tied the an acronym gear to it. All right. Was, was that at the discretion of the governor's office or what? Yes, I mean, those funds, essentially CRF was the big uh, bucket under CARES, right? And then discrete funding through ESSER was targeted to LEAs. LEAs are school districts. So part of ESSER was to make sure that districts got money directly, but then they gave each governor a pot of money and its gear is basically designed uh, to be additional education support, but it gave governors some flexibility to look at areas that might not have been addressed through CRF or ESSER. Um, and Governor Scott uh, focused in pretty quickly on CTE uh, because the CT centers weren't really addressed either through ESSER or CRF. And they were also, particularly around reopening, had, had a lot of reopening costs and so forth. So we thought gear was the best, best use there. I, my, my question was, is, was that simply money given to the governor to use as the governor saw fit? More or less within within okay. parameters. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank yeah, you. the parameters are I would say comparable. You know, it's, I think it, I think of CRF as being very restrictive, ESSER being less restrictive. Gear is sort of in that same category. It just gave it to the governors to to allocate, but they have to be used in accordance with uh, COVID related education uh, needs. There's a discrete list of the use, available uses. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I think that's Senator Sorotkin. You have a question. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of reference being made to the uh, CRF funds as being the big bucket. How much was allocated for education within the CRF funds and were they part of the 1.25 billion or are they a standalone? Fred, do you wanna answer that? I got off mute. Um, they, they, were, they were part of the CRF fund centers rocking. They are the CARES Act. Um, so they're part of that $1.25 billion we got. That was the money, the CRF funds were the money that you all directed towards the end of the session. You started out at the, I can't remember what that first budget number was, the one you did the, the, the short budget for FY21. Um, you directed us to have X amount of dollars that went to various things. Then when you came back in the session in the fall, the, the rest. I, I believe the total amount was around $103 million, which was broken out. I'm, I might be off by that by a little bit, but that was broken out between Efficiency Vermont, Child Nutrition Programs, um, uh, Summer's Food, and then money to the LEAs plus independent schools. So, it, but, it, but it all came out of the CARES Act. It's all part of that $1.25 billion. So was there uh, Madam Chair, can I ask a quick question? Oh, I, sorry, well, I think Sorokin. let Senator Surratt can finish. I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize he wasn't Senator. done. I'm sorry, sorry so about that. Of Maybe we could take the slides down if we're really into discussion and then we can see each other. Can we do that? There we are, okay. So just as a follow-up, is the 103 million, was that discretionary with the legislature? Could we have put more money into education and less money into economic recovery, for instance? Madam Chair, I would almost defer that question to you as a member of the Joint Fiscal Committee, but I, th I think that was more discretionary in terms of how much was coming to the, to the yes, uh, school. I think after we got through the emergency funding last year, that the bulk of this went through the appropriations process. You remember this committee did all the work on broadband and recommended amount, I believe probably the Education Committee did work on education. I see Senator Hardy yeah, nodding and recommended it. But the, the big expenditures, the block grants, if you will, of CRF went through the appropriations process. Okay. And Senator Hardy, can you add to that? Yeah, just for clarification, um, Brad, the first um, chunk of money was a $50 million appropriation um, that was given in our first round in June. And that was mostly focused on summer nutrition programs and a few other expenses for basically getting schools to September. And then in our second round, we added another 54 million. I believe the total was around 104 million, Brad. And we took a lot of testimony in the education committee to get to that number about what the estimates from um, local um, business managers were gonna be. We worked with Secretary French and this whole team you see here. 
um, and came up with that number of $104 million. Um, the House had put in, I think, $96 million, and we in the Senate upped it. Um, to 104 million, and it was part. We could have given them more, but that was the number that that was based on the testimony we got from school districts and the agency seemed to be the right number at the time. Right. Got one last question, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't know if it was Brad or the or the secretary, but someone said the CARES money was most restricted. The ESSER money was less so, and the GEAR money was even less so. What restrictions are you talking about? Yeah, I was speaking to um, the require the federal requirements as to what are allowable expenditures. So I think you know that's I think how I view them. In particular, the CRF, um, the legislature had to navigate some pretty tight restrictions in terms of how to allocate those funds to ensure uh, the costs were directly associated with COVID. Um, ESSER, to a certain extent, I view is less restrictive because it basically says we assume school districts are going to have costs related to the recovery. We are going to give this, this funding directly to school districts as long as they're using the funding in accordance with an established federal program and it can be justified as a COVID expense. They, they have some discretion in terms of how they use the funds. Uh, GEAR uh, basically said to governors, and if there's anything that's not being addressed through ESSER in education, as long as it's within these general five parameters, feel free to decide how you want to use the funding. So um, I think it's in that in the timeline aspect, for me, for, that makes a useful dichotomy because CRF had very res more restrictions, but also a shorter timeline. So everyone put their energy on that, particularly Senator Hardy said about reopening costs. ESSER is sort of the longer term funds. Uh, and we've certainly encouraged districts to sort of look at CRF first, now that we're anticipating moving into recovery, we know there's a whole whole bunch of work ahead of us in terms of the recovery phase of this emergency. And it was just what, what, to wait. What does recovery mean? What? Starting to, to go back to normal. And particularly, I think in education, I would define recovery as uh, beginning to mitigate uh, the effects of the uh, pandemic on student learning and uh, their development. When does, when does the, what's the, what do you predict is the milestone of the beginning of recovery. Well, and given the that the pandemic is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we yeah, I don't know do if it's getting bigger and bigger. It's to recover from. Yeah, so. I think you know it's certainly um, it's a complex topic, but we see it as being uh, the ability to get back to more in person because the in person is really the way we're going to address in, not only the instructional needs of kids but also the relationships and routines. Uh, that have all been di disrupted. So it's an intersection sort of projection of conditions improving, not conditions getting worse and worse, if you will, but particularly with the advent of vaccine, warmer weather coming, okay. uh, the okay. modeling we're... Madam, Madam Chair, I, I get hung up on definitions, but all this money has been spent on recovery and recovery hasn't started yet. So how do we that put that into context? Okay, I don't think the money it's been spent on coping is and keeping the educational system functioning. I yeah, the bulk think. of the, the money is CRF particularly is about reopening school and being able to operate school in, in the conditions of pandemic. When I use the word phrase recovery, it's like emergency recovery. It's like after the emergency is over, you know, how do we begin to address those needs of students? And we're going to have learning loss and things like that. The emergency is not over, and we've spent it all. So, no, no, what do we? Okay, we Sandra, we I think there's more money coming. Oh yeah. well, I just so what do we call that? Recovery, recovery money, or okay, Senator, I think you're getting money, argumentative, or, and I believe I had recognized. I think okay. it was Senator Bray ahead of you. I, I I'm maybe Senator. the understanding I, what we're talking about with okay. certain Let titles and them, vocabulary. Thank you. Um, All right. I, just, I wanted to ask this question before we lost the secretary because it's kind of a 60,000 foot question and that is um, we need to respond to the emergency we have and so that's how we've been responding. No question about it and uh, I'm just wondering to what degree we're investing in things that will in some way not uh, serve us well or won't be that useful once we get back to you know real normal. I mean, it, you know, if you need a fire engine, an extra fire engine, you gotta get one to put out the fire, but you might end up with an extra fire engine. Uh, or 
is most of this uh, most of our investments repurposable, and you can see them transitioning into um, you know schools once we're back to normal. Yeah, I think that's a great question, particularly with Senator McDonald's line of questioning, because so much of the initial investment was about buying the fire engines, you know, putting up, uh, buying masks, PPE, you know, things that we're probably never going to use again, knock on wood. Uh, but as we start moving into recovery, I think very much so we have to be very strategic about um, having the system evolve in a way that can, can improve the system after the uh, epidemic's over. In particular, I'm, I'm going to transition out of this meeting to go meet with my partners at Mental Health. Um, so we, we're spending a lot of time partnering with them in anticipation of this recovery phase mm -hmm. so that the relationships we build doing the recovery work will continue after the recovery period is over. So, for example, um, in my experience as a school leader, I've worked in the Northeast Kingdom for 15 years, worked in southwestern Vermont for nine years. I've noticed over the years there's a significant difference in terms of how mental health services are provisioned in each region of the state. So COVID certainly exposed those inequities of how service delivery is happening. One of the things we wanna come out the other end of this as part of our response is a more integrated response to social service delivery with education. So I won't say full service school model, but also to ensure that all regions of the state are being served adequately. Great, well, thank you. I, I think at some point I, we have gotten some distressing building condition report, I think shortly before we went home. And I know we put money out for HVAC, but that's also essential, um, making sure that the air is clean. Um, and I think at some point in this discussion, I'd like to get to, those are ongoing investments. Um, and we have a fairly aged school building population. So maybe talking about those kinds of investments. So uh, uh, if I could real quick, uh, oh, yep. um, I think this is a great uh, segue into uh, Brad's update on CRF. So we can, we can do a deeper dive into uh, CRF and we can talk about the, uh, the LEA portion of that. We can talk about Efficiency Vermont and the $18 million that they've invested, as well as the, uh, the other uh, programs. So um, if that's acceptable to you. That sounds fine. Brad? All right, so the CRF money, which we've kind of been talking about in the background here and in the foreground and all kinds of different places, is, as has been said, it was, it was more restricted than its use. Um, the federal folks, when they wrote that language, made it fairly tight that it could only be used for certain things. And then as time progressed and, and U.S. Treasury, who was running the program, started sending out guides that loosened up a little bit. Um, so pe people use it for different pieces. The money, the monies that you all appropriated from for CRF, for the C CRF monies that you appropriated to be used, um, I, you gave, initially gave six and a half million dollars to Efficiency Vermont for HVAC systems. And they they were able to they were able to come up with another seven million dollars I believe it was um, that they could use in the districts and they've used most of that we're still in here where they are right now at this at this point I don't think we've heard yet but they basically spent thirteen and a half million dollars on HVAC systems and upgrades bringing bringing the school district the school buildings I should say up up to uh, the the CDC and ASHRAE recommendations for what what is needed for ventilation there. My understanding from talking to business managers, there's still a pretty good sized demand out there for more HVAC projects um, that, you know, bringing things up to code. Um, some of it can be some of it can be done by doing simple, you know, equipment in terms of air purifiers and things like that, which a lot of them done. Others are more involved and need, need more work in, in their actual HVAC system itself. So that's, that's, that's a discussion. That's my concern when the 14 million was coming back and saying, does that mean every school's got adequate air? <laughs> I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Okay. Um, and, and one of the things we've talked about with that 14, 15 million dollars that's coming back is seeing what exactly efficiency Vermont still can do and what, what that what that cost would be. Because I know that they didn't do some things because of supply chain issues. 
the the federal folks came out with with um, information on how you could deal with supply chain issues. Basically, they said that if you ordered it and then it didn't come through no fault of your own, that was okay and you could spend for it. But if you knew it was going to come beyond the December thirtieth cutoff date, then you could not order it. It was not. It was not. <laughs> it was. It was not an allowable expense. So, so that, that got in the way, not only with, with some of the HVAC stuff, but some of the other stuff with the school districts themselves. So w- one, of our, one of our ideas is to, that with that $14, $50 million that, that is going to come back is to take some of that and, and, allow, and allow Efficiency Vermont to finish up whatever projects they could that were due to supply chain disruptions, things that, like that. We still don't know what the, what the size of that is. Um, I don't believe they've gotten back to us in terms of that they are supposed to any day now, but I don't think we've heard as of right now. But I, but I agree with you. I think there is more out there. And having heard from the business managers, I would say there definitely is more out, more demand out there for more HVAC system. Okay. Um, the new ESSER money can be used for HVAC system, but we need to be careful with that because we and the agency don't have the expertise to uh, monitor those projects and, and, and see, what, see how they're doing and sign off on it. That's not, that's not our area at all. That's why Fiscally Vermont stepped in. When, with the CRF money, so back back to the CRF money, um, there was there was more money that was also given to um, child nutrition for equipment. Um, they too had some issues. They they weren't sure. I'm not quite sure what happened, but they hit, they had roughly four million dollars for equipment. Um, you know, to, uh, di- different refrigeration units, et cetera, things like that. Um, and they had some issues where they they. The supply chain issue rose its head too, but I'm not quite sure in what sense because I haven't talked to people about that. But the money's going to go back to them, so they're going to be able to use their money for what we initially had thought they would be doing. In terms of the school districts, um, it, as as was mentioned earlier, it was it was a funny, it was, it was all very fun, not funny. It was very awful timing in terms of when the CRF money was going to expire on December 30th, 2020, and then when when the new bill was signed, I think it was on December 27th or 28th, I've forgotten which, um, that allowed it to go for another year. In, in that period of time, because there was a cutoff date, we were working with the fifth floor finance and management, and they had wanted to know how much money is not going to be spent so that they could take that money from education that was not being used and reallocate it out to other areas of the state. And that's what that $15 million came from. We thought there was about $15 million we weren't going to use. And so that was going to be allocated out. There was lots of discussion in the background, which you're probably aware of. And since it is, since the language was signed, the bill was signed, then the money is going to come back to, to us is, is how it appears. Um, so and, and that so in that case, because I had I'd had business managers say once we gave that money up, but now it's going to be extended. Well, it hasn't been extended yet, and we don't have the money; it's gone. But it's coming back, so we'll get it back out to them. Well, the um, joint fiscal back. committee declined to spend it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the school districts, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so so that's that's kind of that's kind of where that stands. That's what that fifteen million dollars is. There's probably it's, it'll probably be a little bit more because it's looking like not all districts were able to spend all their CRF money before the grant expired on December thirtieth. The way we wrote the grants was the money expired on December thirtieth. Boom, the grant died on December thirtieth. If you did not spend your money before December thirtieth, then that money will get swept back in. So that that fifty million dollars will probably go up by how much I don't know. But it will probably go back up some. Um, what else along those lines? Um, so I, I think I think just going back in general to the CRF money again, as I said, it was fairly restricted in its use. It could not it, initially when it came out, and and you guys as, as the legislature ran into this with the education fund. It it said you cannot use that money to replace lost revenues. Um, and so, so that that was the, that was a hard thing. But then again, as time progressed, U.S. Treasury came out with guidance that relaxed that a little bit, and they allowed for CRF money to to be used for 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 lack of a better term, repurposed money that was in your budget that was used for a significantly different purpose. So one of the things they said that was significantly different, and I think we talked about this last spring and fall, um, was 
the the amount of time that teachers were spending that staff not just teachers but staff were planning on get doing remote learning on getting ready for remote learning not remote learning itself but planning for remote learning that was a reimbursable cost even though those costs were in your budget because you're paying your salaries but they were being used for a significantly different purpose according to u.s treasury so some of that money is is the money that is going to that was sent out to the districts they now were in, if it was an FY20 or FY21, they now got that money replaced. They have money sitting there. And that's the money that we're talking about that's in Act 154 and whatever the first act was, which I still can't remember the number, um, where, where we're rolling that money, that, that money forward so that we are spent sending less money out from the education fund this year in terms of education spending, because they already have this federal money there in, on hand. And that is gonna fall. But we'd the hope you'd figure out how to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're working on that. Um, okay. It's, it's getting, getting a little clear. We, we don't have a good number. I'll give you the best number in just a second, then Senator Hardy, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> give, just stop talking for a moment. Um, the, the number that I just got from asking business managers right now, and this is not the final number, is not nowhere near as robust as I had hoped it would be. It's about $8.7 million. Currently in the Ed Fund Outlook statement, you're carrying a, line of, a, a number of $10.9 million. So we're, we're down. And that's just the way the business managers chose to use the money. And I'll answer questions with that minute, but I'll let Senator Hardy okay. go first. Oh, I'm Senator sorry. Hardy, Senator Chief, you, have a, you should share. Question. Should yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and Brad. Um, Brad, you know, you and I talked last spring uh, mm -hmm. a number of times, I would say. Um, and one of my concerns then was um, that this 104 million plus other funds be distributed equitably to school districts. and you know, with the reimbursement model, um, a lot of it is dependent on the school districts having a sophisticated enough business management office um, to come in and get the reimbursements. And I'm wondering on the ground what you're seeing um, in terms of are the school districts getting those reimbursements in a, in a broadly equitable way or is it really, really concentrated on the school districts that have a more sophisticated operation? That, it, 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 it's hard to say. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I know all the business managers. I know how they work. Um, and what I what I what I've noticed in this is that a lot of them did not spend a lot of their monies in FY20 because of the school closure, basically for the last third of the year, roughly. And so so a lot of them had that money, and they used that money for different purposes. You know, they probably could have had it reimbursed by CRF, but they didn't claim it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I spent I spent hours and hours and hours and hours talking to business managers, asking them, you know, trying trying to get them to claim this money to help the Ed Fund, and they they were trying they were very nervous and very cautious about it because they weren't sure that is are the Fed's going to come in and say that it's not that it's not an allowable cost, and I kept saying, well, if they do, it's our problem, not your problem, because how the lines are the states in the back, you know, we'll get it back somehow, but the states in the back, not the districts. Um, but they were they were concerned that the costs would be disallowed, and so they didn't want to put themselves in that position. So some of what we're we're seeing that doesn't appear make it appear equitable is how they chose to do things um, on an on an individual basis. They their 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 first and and strongest inclination was to make sure their school districts are whole and healthy, um, and then after that they started thinking about other things. In terms of the Ability or the in, in terms of the savvy, maybe um, of business managers as to who's going to account for it, it was all over the map. Um, there were big districts that asked for a lot. There were big districts that didn't ask for a lot. Um, there was there were some there were districts that asked for very little. Um, and why they did it the way they did, I don't know. Um, I, again, as I said, I, I spent lots of time talking with them in, in, in their monthly meetings and individually um, trying to get them to do it. I think, I think in terms of equity, um, if you looked at it on, on a, any way you want to look to, and any way you want to look at it, I do have, want to parse it out on, on a per pupil basis, on a district basis, on an SU basis. No, it's not equitable. Um, but do they think it was equitable? Most of them do. I did have a couple of them say, well, what did everybody else put in? You know, if my number so low, why, how did they put everything, how did they put everything else? And they just, they just worked at it more is, is, is the large part. Um, do you but, have, do you have a spreadsheet of the reimbursements, uh, the CRF money and how that was allocated to districts? 
what I what I have what I have right now is I have their budgets for, from their grants. We we they in order to get a grant, they had to send us a budget that explained that showed us how they're going to use the money. Now they could use, they could switch around how they use the money within that budget as time progressed. Uh huh. But I but I do have that, and I just got it updated this morning. I do have a spreadsheet that has that has all the different. Um, Costs in it. Are you willing to share that? Or? Oh, sure, ab absolutely. They'll, they'll, they'll love it. <laughs> yes, I would I love would, to. You know how much I, know I love you spreadsheets. Love <laughs> I, I know you like that. <laughs> and I just, we will let you repay, do report to the committee on what you find in all those spreadsheets. I would love to. I love spreadsheets. And I just wanted to also ask Bill if he can share that his presentation because the, what is up on our website is actually a different slide deck. Um, so I don't know if it got sent over or if it just hasn't been posted yet, but there's a, there's a different slide deck up on our, our website for today from AOE. Absolutely. We'll uh, be sure to share. Thank you. Um, Brad, are you, we interrupted you. Not really. I mean, I, you know, you know me, Senator Cummings, I just wing it anyway, hugely. Um, um, no, I, I think I was just trying to think of what what are the big things were out there. I mean, I, there there are it, the the uses that they that they made with the um, with the, the the CRF money are similar to to what they did. If I look at it by general area, um, roughly I, I'd say roughly thirty percent went to direct instruction, so in, to in classroom type things, um, and and roughly twenty percent of it went to um, the maintenance of the buildings and, and grounds and such because the, there was a lot of work done with that that's that might cost some that might be some of the um, the rentals that people were doing and, and things like that um, and then the the next biggest pot of money was probably the instructional staff support service and I'll send you all this information I'm looking at a spreadsheet at the moment um, and then if you look at it more by expenditure type um, we have we have roughly almost thirty percent was in well if, you, if I take the salaries and benefits together we have about 37, 38 percent was of of all the money that was the CRF money was that was budgeted was in, in salaries and benefits, um, and then the next biggest chunk of money was about four, the large chunk of money pardon me was just just over thirty nine percent that was for supplies so that be PPE. Um, the supplies and, and then the, then equipment was a little bit more and, and so that would cover some of the. Um, the, uh, the, the laptops and the Chromebooks and such. And it would also cover some of the equipment that they were using for, for making hotspots and things like that, which goes back to your, your question, Senator Cummings, about um, you know, getting people to be able to get access to the internet. Um, so they're, they, 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 money's kind of in, in pretty broad areas. They're not the same areas that Jill was showing you, but they're similar to them. Um, I just kind of took it straight out of their budgets as to what they're doing. And again, these numbers will change. I don't think they'll change significantly, but that's that's kind of how it's looking right now at the moment. A lot of it, a lot of it was personnel and a lot of it was for supplies. That's, that's where the largest pieces went. So you had something to... Yeah, and I can just add a little bit of detail. Um, I think Senator Hardy, you would want to know this about the um, Child Nutrition Equipment Grant. Uh, and so, um, that went uh, quite a lot of it went to, you know, just the general supplies, but also um, large equipment like walk in freezers and refrigerators because uh, schools are having to store quite a lot more meals than they usually would since they're not serving them um, day to day. And then we also had three, possibly four, I need to double check my number. Um, districts that purchased uh, vans so that they can deliver food uh, for students that are learning remotely. Um, so those are sort of some of the big cost categories for the child nutrition equipment. And they did, there was $4 million that was granted. And I think at last count, like over 380,000 of it was um, already in their budgets. And then we've given them the additional time to use up any anything that's left over. So they did make good use of that. And they, as Brad said, they ran into the supply chain issues as well. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Jill. I, I had talked to the agency about that and it sounds like you made a really good use of the equipment and supplies and child nutrition, which warms my heart. Thank you. 
other questions here on where the money went. Is there a list? I guess part of what health and welfare is talking about doing is having a, a emergency, you know, a disaster plan. All the one we have right now is aimed towards uh, a physical disaster. You know, the tornado takes down the school. It doesn't usually take down every school in the state, which the pandemic did. And just, are we following um, how many schools ha have adequate HVAC systems? How many don't? We had some discussion the other day about if we've got money to put in the systems, um, could this be used for radon mitigation that we haven't done the testing for? Um, lead turned out to be fairly inexpensive to fix, but radon could be fairly inexpensive to very expensive, uh, depending on the construction. And are, are we think are we doing any thinking about because we've got another pot of money coming in? Um, we know a lot of that's going to have to go to probably remedial, just education, mental health. You know, I'm now a second grader and I haven't learned to walk in a straight line and be quiet in the hall, um, and I'm going to need to to learn that at some point, but Jill. So um, we did just really, as Brad was, was speaking about Efficiency Vermont, get some information from them that just came in. Um, so in terms of the additional HVAC need, uh, I'm reading the email as we're looking at it here. Um, they've identified that 40 to 50 schools in the state have no form of mechanical HVAC, which is the primary pathway for improving indoor air quality in schools. Um, in addition, they, as, as Brad said, they do have projects that they had to limit the scope of um, due to the um, supply chain issues. So they have literally, you know, breaking news just provided us with sort of three um, sort of categories of, of need that still exist in the state. Um, in terms of the physical plant, the one thing I would caution is that um, no matter what the pot of money is, uh, there does need to be a justification that it's COVID related, right? So indoor air quality, very clear, um, you know, something like radon, I'm, I'm not sure that's something that we would need to go back to the feds and actually get confirmation, is that an allowable cost? Um, and so, and I'm, I'm wondering if it would be useful since we've sort of hinted at this new bucket of funding that's coming in and it speaks to one of Senator McDonald's concerns, if it would be helpful to discuss what's in the um, CRRSA bill or the CARISA bill, as we're calling it, because we've got to call okay. it something. <laughs> the new bill. The new bill. And Senator Hardy, this is the slide deck that you were provided with that you were referencing. Ah, OK. Um, yeah. So this, Bill, would you yes. like me to take, take point on that, or do you feel like jumping on that one? If you can share it, that would be great. Okay, I will, I will do, oh, I don't know if I can share it because I'm not, Senator Cummings, I have to be like a co-presenter, right? You have to be a co-host. So, yeah. Bill, if you want to have share the it. slide deck. No, you are now co-host. Ah, you are now a co-host, so you it's can okay. ask and you shall receive, so you can now share. <laughs> Okay, let me see. What Senator Brock, you have a question before we No, Okay, your hand is up. <laughs> Must be from previously. I haven't seen it before. If I get my cursor near anybody, I get a white hand, but this was a yellow hand. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, let me see if I can do this as slideshow. Teams I've got down, Zoom is a new animal for me, so. All right. 
So Essa, um, and now we have Carissa. Yes, Carissa. Uh, so I think it would be helpful again to sort of talk about the different buckets. Um, if something that's popped up that says give that subtitles well. a try. I'm, ah, I'm there not it goes. going to give subtitles a try. Okay, not right now. All no. right. <laughs> Um, so here is the overview of what exists in these programs, and you'll you'll notice some familiar faces here. So um, what we have here, this was in the bill that was passed on December 27th and was part of a, a larger sort of omnibus spending bill. Uh, we have the ESSER 2, GEAR 2, a new program within GEAR that's called the Emergency Assistant for non-public schools, and I'll, I'll speak about that. The extension of the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which is CRF, and then some um, additional money for child nutrition programs, um, which I can also uh, kind of outline in, in uh, the broad strokes of that one. So um, for ESSER 2, this is um, really, it's going to be a new grant, but it's really an extension of what we saw in ESSER 1. It's the same um, allocation formula, but about four times as much money. So uh, ESSER 1 was 28 million and our LEAs will receive $114 million. So a substantial increase at the same allocation. Uh, the SEA set aside, so what the agency is able to hold is uh, 12.6 million. And, um, and I'll talk about some of the key details of this in just a moment. So substantially more money than ESSER 1. And so Senator McDonald, this gets a little bit to your concern that you expressed, which is, wait, we're not even through the pandemic and we've already spent all of this money here's the next big sort of um, tranche of money that's coming in. So the key points on this one is that um, while ESSER 1 goes through September of 2022, ESSER 2 goes an additional year. So September of 2023. And the other sort of headliner on this is that there is no equitable services requirement. So ESSER 1 had a requirement that uh, non-public schools had to be able to um, have some allocation of services and goods through the LEA. This does not have that requirement. And I'll talk about where the support for non-public schools is going to come from in just a moment. There's also um, of note for this group, I would imagine, is that the maintenance of effort requirement has been changed, the, the language. And um, if we have questions about this, I'll let Brad speak to that because that is definitely in his wheelhouse. But the ESSER 1 had sort of a dollar to dollar that needed to be maintained. The language here is a proportional share of the state's support for elementary and secondary education relative this, to the state's overall spending must be maintained between 2017, 2018, 2019. So that is also a change that would be, I think, important uh, to note here. Same allowable costs for ESSER, which are actually quite broad. It's basically a, a list of about 12 categories and then anything that is an allowable use in any of our regular federal funding can be used for ESSER. So as the secretary was saying, the, the range of uses here is, is pretty large. Uh, and then um, there is a specific emphasis in the legislation on measuring and addressing learning loss. And the state has a requirement to report within six months on how we are using these funds to measure and address learning loss. So there, there is that specific language in there. Uh, any questions on ESSER before I move to the next bucket? And I yeah, can't see I, if anyone's raising their hands. So. Yeah, okay. I think I saw Senator Hardy's voice pop up. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Jill, could you just explain a little bit more about the proportional share? I'm, I'm reading it and I'm trying to wrap my head around it a little bit more. Brad, maybe. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, what, what it is, Senator Hardy, is, is right right now with the current ESSER, forgetting this piece, the current ESSER says that, that we have to maintain the same or 
higher level of spending for education than the average of 17, 18, and 19. So for FY20 and FY21, they have to be higher than the averages. That's not a problem that we would bet that. What this is now saying though, is that proportionally in terms of the state's budget, we can't drop below whatever that average was for 17, 18, and 19. I don't think we will, but I haven't looked at any of those numbers yet, but it's, it's looking at percentages instead of the state as a whole, as, as opposed to a dollar figure. Okay, okay, got it. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions on ESSER? Back so I can see everybody. Okay. Okay, I'll go back to sharing. And Nathan Lavery, I know you've joined us. Um, unless you have some real time constraint, I'll recognize you once we finish this presentation, if that works. Sure, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Nathan, you may enjoy the show as well. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So the next, and can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so the next bucket of funds here is the GEAR Fund, which again is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. There are two different programs within this. Uh, so the first one, the total that the state of Vermont is receiving is just over $6 million. The first one is what's being called GEAR 2, and it is basically the same program as the first gear in terms of what it can be used on, um, who the eligible entities are. We are in conversation with the governor's office right now to determine where these funds will be prioritized. So that has yet to be determined. The second is, and so that's about 1.9 million. The second uh, funding stream here under gear is called the Emergency Assistance for Non-Public Schools, the EANS. And this is where what would have been equitable shares in ESSER is now being designated into a separate grant. And uh, usually the LEAs would um, be tasked with doing the equitable shares consultations with the, uh, with the non-public schools and then also administering the contracts and services that those schools receive because they are not allowed to receive the actual money. That is basically being put on to the SEA and onto the Agency of Education. Uh, so that's how that, that has moved. So for non-public schools, uh, we have a total of 4.28 million, 200,000 of that can be retained by the SEA for administering the program. Both of these GEAR funds have that same period of performance that goes September, all the way through September of 2023 and goes back to March 13th of 2020. So they do have the potential to um, receive uh, reimbursements for costs incurred if needed. So that is the, uh, the GEAR fund. And again, some of the highlights here I've, I've already spoken about. Um, the GEAR non-public, the EANS, is an opt-in program, meaning that the state of Vermont has to decide to apply for it and then submit an application to the US Department of Education. So that is a decision point that we are awaiting from the governor's office right now. Any questions on GEAR? Anybody have any questions? I can't see you, so just yeah. speak up. I can either. Okay, I'm not hearing any, so. Okay. All right, um, we've already discussed this, that the Coronavirus Relief Fund is being extended through uh, December of next year. And as Brad has, has already highlighted all the, the details around that, so. And then the last thing is the um, Child Nutrition Emergency Funds. This is through USDA as part of the CARISA Act. Um, I would direct folks, if you would need specific detail on this, to Rosie Kruger, our State Director of Child Nutrition, because she will be able to answer the details on this much better than I can. But essentially, um, there's an opportunity if 
particularly LEAs, but all school food authorities and our child and adult care food programs, the CACFP, if those sponsors have lost revenue because they are not doing as many in-person meals, a la carte paid meals, they have the um, potential to be reimbursed for 55% of that revenue loss and they're measuring between two specific dates. Uh, so the impact could be variable here. We're seeing that the CACFPs perhaps will not have the same decrease in revenue. They don't provide meals in the same way. Um, but that our school food authorities will likely benefit from this. Uh, we're awaiting USDA guidance and further information on this, which they're required to provide by the end of the month. So there's not a lot of detail on this at this point, but more is forth forthcoming on that. And so that's my high level overview of the, the next round of spending. Um, so I can stop sharing at this point and if folks have a question, let me know. <laughs> I will try to stop sharing at this point. It won't let me stop sharing at this point. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Madam okay. Chair. Senator Madam McDonald. Chair. Um, I, I did. What, how did it come to pass that I, I don't understand what the governor's office on such and such, how that fits in with the rest of the funding for education. Um, uh, do we have a governor's office fund for broadband or a governor's office fund for highway improvements? Or, I mean, how did that, how did that where'd that come from? Brad, I think said, has an answer. I, I, Senator McDonald, it, it's in the federal legislation. That, that they, they specified it. Um, and they, they said in, in the original gears, they said they broke, they broke up the, uh, the ESSER money and the gears money. And they said, this piece is for the governor to use as, as, he, as he wants in terms of education. And that's not unique to Vermont or for that's for all? That's for everything. It was, it was in the federal act. It's, oh, so, okay. so that was for all states. Okay. So Probably has very little to do with Vermont. Boy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Marketing boy. There you go. <laughs> Well, you know, you make compromises at two in the morning. That's true. Things can get a little strange. You guys have all been there. Yeah. So we're okay. about to go there again, and I'm I'm grateful for this hearing to to try and learn what not to do again. Yeah. That's right. We're all getting older, and it's harder to make decisions at two in the morning. <laughs> All right, um, committee, uh, I've got too many screens. I've lost my agenda. There we go. Any questions? Because we are scheduled for a break. Actually, we're a few minutes early for a break. Um, but I've got Nathan Lavery wanted to make a few comments. That will get us up to the scheduled break, I think. And then I'm going to take, I'd say at this point, I'm going to give you a good half hour break. So you can, if as long as I think Chloe can come in at 3.30 and um, give everybody a chance to rest their eyeballs and stretch their backs. And then we'll come back and give me feedback. This is one long break. I know Senator Bray was going to try smaller 10 minute breaks. I think we're all trying to figure out what coping mechanisms work. Senator <sighs> McDonald, your head is now on that calf's body. When you move around, <laughs> strange things happen. Now I have ears. Now you have ears. <laughs> Okay, Senator Hardy, you had something before we... Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, mention to Brad and, and others um, from AOE, it, this is really helpful to get an update on this. Um, but, and I'm wondering if in the future, maybe Chloe's gonna touch on this a little bit, the interactions between this federal money and our state um, money and the um, school district budgets um, and how this is gonna impact decisions we're gonna have to make down the road about um, state funding for 
education, um, especially with that proportional requirement and and whether, yeah, anyway, the sort of bigger we're, picture interaction with state funds. We're going to have, I, if, I don't know how much detail Chloe's going into today. I think it's just a, our annual overview of the ed fund as it sits. I know we're going to get some changes in the revenue forecast. Um, so that, you know, we will have, we also have the report coming in from the tax department for changes in uh, how we raise property tax. So um, we will be having lots of discussion. But I, I want to make sure we can't do the revenue until it's set next week. But once it's set, then, you know, the new revenue forecast, then we can start really working. Senator Bray, you're muted, Senator. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to, well, one, say thank you to AOE for walking us through uh, a very organized presentation on a lot of moving parts with a lot of money in different buckets. So that's been really helpful. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I have the big picture straight. Even though we're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, it, it's, is it correct for me to think of it uh, as not taking any pressure off our state uh, education budget because these are really all oriented to uh, paying for extraordinary expenses as opposed to displacing expenses we would have paid through ordinary means. And yeah, I, I thought I'd heard the secretary had a, a small tweak on that one. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's part, part of the money is going to help the Ed Fund. The vast majority of it will not be. It will be for new and unusual and budgeted expenditures, as, as you're mentioning. But part of it, again, based on the guidance that um, came out for the federal folks, does allow for some of the money to be used for monies that were budgeted that were coming out of the, that would have come out of the education fund that can now stay in the education fund. So that will help the bottom line some. I hear that was about eight. That, about eight point seven million dollars is what yeah, is the I number. I thought I I heard about eight million. Yeah, not not wow. not, not as I said, not as robust as I had hoped. Uh, you know that that is uh, kind of decimal dust when you get to the I end. Know, right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, since uh, I haven't had to keep track of this uh, until coming back to this committee, where are we on total spend for education? 1.7 billion, is that about right these days? Uh, yeah, I, I, I might be closer. Yeah, I, th I think about one, I think it might be closer to 1.8. We're not at 1.8 yet, but I think it's close to 1.8 to 1.7. Okay, so as the chair says, decimal dust. So it's, yes. we're always grateful for money, but it's it's not a big dent in the one point eight billion. It, it, that that's right, but but it but it all helps whatever that that um, gap is down at the bottom. You know, yeah. it would have been yeah. nice had it been larger, but it doesn't appear to be. It wouldn't be decimal dust in my budget, but uh, right. <laughs> no, I know either. <laughs> no, yeah, I'd I'd like just a part of that, a little mm -hmm. dust of that little dust. Okay, Senator Sorotkin. Can any of the money be used for like? capital expenditures, as far as you can tell? Um, I don't I don't think so, because the, the federal legislation was kind of, I guess, guidance, not legislation, was, was really saying, talking about what could be used to address the emergency itself immediately. I mean, if you, if you talk HVAC as being part of capital, then yes. If you talk about building a new building, um, building a new wing on a building, renovating, it, that's much more up in the air, and and the, the, it it was a, it was a lot more questionable. Possible though, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say possible, but I but I think before we we went anywhere with it, we being the agency went anywhere with it, we would certainly be checking in with with people who have a have a higher opinion or a, a, a higher on the decision level makers than we are. Um, and we're probably talking to federal people too. When you do things like HVAC and energy efficiency, can that subsume other construction as well as necessary 
like a new classroom or something like that. Um, yeah. I, I think I think it all depends on how on I, my guess is my strong feeling is where you're going to the federal folks are going to come out and audit all these costs in the states how closely they do it I don't know but I'm sure they're going to come out and look and and I think we'd want to err more on the cost side saying instead of them saying you know we're thinking well this might be okay let's do it and them saying nope that's not okay send that money back I, so it, it, it's it's a good question Senator I don't know the answer um, the finance and management has has uh, taken on a, a group called Guide House as a consulting firm where they get a little bit very that's well. Other, yeah, I, I thought you probably did. <laughs> um, so. They always say no. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you don't ask. Get creative. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for <laughs> Bill and Brad and Jill? If not. Well, Jill, is, Jill has her hand up. Uh, Jill yeah. has her hand up. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so just to add a little bit to what Brad said, the the new ESSER 2 um, does, in addition to some language around indoor air quality, has some language around the, the like adjustments needed to like the physical plant of a classroom or school in order to meet health guidelines. So that's sort of the bottom line on, on I think your question and, and why Brad is, is leaning towards caution, which I, I think is correct, is that any of these costs have to have a clear, for CRF it was COVID necessary, like that was a very clear kind of line in the sand. Esther, there's a little bit more wiggle room, but it's, it is, um, we've seen schools do things like they've added a vestibule to the front of the school so that yeah. they can do health screenings as students walk in, or they've added outdoor classroom space so that they can continue to teach music class or whatever it may be. Um, so if it was additional spaces needed in order to meet the six foot health guidelines, then that is a, a justifiable COVID necessary expense. If it's deferred maintenance, then we may be getting ourselves in a little bit more more hot water there. So building a new wing on the school. Yeah, that's that, it. Would probably <laughs> that pool, take that pool we've always wanted. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for the Department of Ed team? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So Nathan? Um, welcome. Why don't you tell us who you are, who you represent at this point? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nathan Lavery. I am the Director of Finance and Operations at the Burlington School District, and I am currently the president of the Vermont Association of School Business Officials, which is the association um, for all your local business managers that where we get together on a monthly basis, we get to hear from the AOE team uh, with guidance on uh, what opportunities and, and obstacles there are to using federal funds. And, and we talk about all sorts of exciting, exciting uh, stuff. But the, um, and I can be pretty brief today. I, I was actually listening in on YouTube for the, uh, the whole presentation. And it, I'd say it was very consistent with everything that we've been told and, and understand about um, all of the federal fund and funding sources at our disposal. The one thing that came up at our last meeting uh, the VASBO meeting, and um, when I believe Bill and, and uh, Jill and Brad were all there, was kind of a question, uh, a wondering, but we thought we should bring it back to, to you folks, and which is the fact that the uh, legislation passed uh, last year that was meant to help mitigate the impact on school taxes, tax rates, um, what it did was it held the ADM constant this year, and so as a result of that, the equalized pupil counts that we are receiving right now from the Agency of Education reflect um, an ADM that is at least not lower than it was the prior year. One of the interesting things about that, of course, is ADM, while it's probably the, the most significant variable, it's really only one of the variables that goes into the calculation of equalized pupils. And so the question came up at our meeting of whether it was the intent of the legislature to uh, hold equalized pupils constant, which would ensure that a, um, a decrease in equalized pupils that may have been attributable to any sort of coronavirus impact 
would not result in an increase in tax rates. So um, the short, you know, the question is, is this a technical kind of situation where, where a technical correction could, could be considered if the intent was really to just hold districts harmless with respect to enrollment changes resulting from equal, uh, or, or whether, it, you know, again, if it was fully the intent and this was, was discussed uh, when the decision was made, then I think we'd just, we'd end the conversation there and, and we wouldn't pursue it further. But that was the question. I think I've captured it correctly. I'd, I'd throw it back to Brad James if he wants to add, uh, he, he, he discussed this with us as well. So Brad, did I overlook anything there? No, I, th I think you summed it up nicely, Nathan. That was that was the base of the conversation after I explained to you why number why the business manager why numbers could change in terms of equalized pupils. I think I will defer to Senator Hardy since she was on education. My recollection, and it just kind of was one of those things that went through as we were cobbling together bills trying to protect schools last year um was exactly that at that point we were hearing about families and you know they were uh, going to go into homeschooling or some people were sending their kids to private school because the private schools were staying open and uh, my daughter's on a school board and has children with some asthma and was thinking about homeschooling them and till her superintendent pointed out that if five kids stayed home that they lost the cost of a teacher. Um, so her kids are back in school. But I think it, we, it was a response to those concerns. I think as in all things we did last year as an emergency response, I at least, I assume most of us are open to be corrected um, by reality, if that's not what happened, um, we kicked the fifty-eight million dollar can down the road too last year, and uh, we're going to have to fix that. So we've got some fixing to do, and look for input. Ruth, did Ed do more work on that? Yeah, we did. And I'm, I actually pulled up Act 137 to see if I could look at the specific language. Brad, do you have the specific language? Because we took a, we worked was, on this. You're talking about the ADM issue, Ruth? That yeah, exactly. Of, yeah, yeah it, basically, it's, it, it, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase. <laughs> it says it says that, um, that your FY21, this current year ADM that goes into FY22 equalized pupils cannot be less than your FY20 ADM, which also goes into your FY22 equals, equalized pupils this two year. I was not necessarily part of those conversations, so I don't know what the thinking was. I do know that people, <clears throat> excuse me, that people were concerned about uh, a lot of kids not coming back to school this this year. Homeschooling numbers did go up. They went up from about 2,000 roughly in last year to about 5,000 this year, an increase of 3,000. 3, um, so it's a significant count. So there are, the, the numbers are down quite a bit. Um, so essentially what was put in place was a hold harmless for ADM, not necessarily equalized pupils because there are other factors in there. And just to and this is, I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but just to let you know, the, the, the other factors are, are where the weighting factors hit, how many kids are in each group, because um, that changes over time. Um, it, 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 the weighting factors also depend on your poverty counts, which have changed, and your state place student counts, which have changed, and your ELL students, which have changed. Those counts have all changed. All those factors, plus the equalization ratio itself, plus whether you were held harmless the prior year, they all factor into, what's, into what Nathan was saying into your equalized pupils this year. We can, we can talk about it. Now's not the, well, now's not the time, but we can the, the talk about it. The ADM count is, is used as the basis for calculating equalized pupils, correct? Right. Yes, so right. the intent was to hold schools harmless for actual pupils that may have been held home, like like Senator Cummings okay. mentioned, um, to hold them harmless for the students who were gonna not be in the classroom. That wasn't intended from my re recollection, and I certainly can't speak for the whole education committee, let alone the entire <laughs> legislature, <laughs> but my, um, recollection from our conversations was just to get at that issue of if students were being kept home 
by parents because they were concerned about COVID or because they couldn't manage the hybrid schooling or because of a whole host of reasons why parents uh, might be worried and keep their kids home or the logistics might be better to keep them home. Um, we were trying to hold schools harmless for that. It wasn't, we didn't get into the details of which kids might be held, kept home, which would be sort of more addressed with the equalized pupil thing. Um, and uh, it was lang the language that we adopted in the Senate, I believe came over from the House. I don't think we changed that language specific to the ADM. And I believe the House language was what was specifically recommended by the Secretary of Education. So uh, Secretary French is the one who we literally took the language he recommended is, is my recollection of it. So it, it was intended to be actual pupils, not equalized pupils is my recollection. But I, I can that, certainly that, speak to my, look through it more detail in detail and we can get back to this if you, if you want. That, There's that going my, to be an, an issue. Um, we, we always are open to making corrections. If I may, yeah, I, I know we're short on time and I, I think that's really helpful context and, and that may be the end of the story. In fact, I think the, the question again that came up um, in the minds of business managers was the fact that holding ADM constant it may make all the sense in the world for exactly the reasons that Senator Hardy just, just discussed. Um, it just doesn't have, I think the impact that some people speculated may have been the intent, which was to hold equalized pupils constant. And obviously if you hold equalized pupils constant, you effectively remove the possibility of a change in equalized pupils as being one of the things that causes a, uh, a, a, a town's uh, tax rate to increase, right? So it could still increase um, even with, or, or decrease, frankly, go in either direction, but equalized pupils could change and have an impact on a tax rate um, even with the Con holding constant uh, ADM, and that's fine. So I, I mean, I, I think what I'm taking from this conversation, frankly, is there was a, a specific intent to address the changes in ADM that could result from COVID, not to say we want to hold equalized pupils constant. And and to me, I think that's I can explain that to my my colleagues, and um, and that that can be the end of it. I, I again want to just reiterate that I don't speak for the whole legislature though, Nathan. So this is just one senator's recollection from last year, and I'm happy to get you know the opinions of the former chair and and my colleagues and others, um, and to look at the materials more, my notes and everything. That I didn't expect this question, so I I wasn't as prepared. So, and I think as you know, again as the budgets get worked out, if there is an issue let us know. I, our intent was to hold schools as harmless as possible from the effects of something they didn't control. Um, so we will be working on school funding quite a bit as usual and we will go forward. Any other questions at this point? Senator McDonald. Uh, Madam Chair, I, um, someone mentioned that Last fall, we cobbled things together. And um, I would say that the Commissioner of Education was an excellent cobbler um, and, did, and did well. And I, I think the reason we're having this discussion is because you often cobble things together when you have an emergency. And then now you take a look at um, what you would do differently for moving forward and what you would um, alter um, now if you thought it was uh, in need of being altered. Um, I'm laying the grounds for our broadband discussion, but the um, we're gonna run into several things were cobbled together and probably try and look at them each with the same intent, so. You don't always do things the most best way um, in an emergency. You have different priorities. I'm going to ask, Chloe, are you available at 3.30? Uh, yes, absolutely. 
Okay, I'm gonna give y'all a break until 3.30. Um, thank everybody. I think this was, now that we've come out, uh, you know, I'll get a, a few steps back from the initial crisis and all the funds. This was very helpful to understand and to see where, where we came from and where we're going and uh, we'll be in touch.